let's get him in here. Yeah, the author of Do What You Want, The Bad Religion Story. Hell yeah. Mr. Jim, how are you? Mr. Jim. Hello, how are you? Good, good. Welcome to Punk Rock Family TV, man. Right on. Thank you for having me. Hey, hey Jim, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing really good. That's good. I'm glad to hear it, man. We appreciate you coming in. Uh, the book was great, man. Oh, thank you. How you, how I see you got you? your suffer shirt on. That's bad. <laughs> That's right. A proper attire, sir. Uh, how long were you? Were, were you like embedded with them? Like, what, what was the deal there? Okay, so uh, I, I was on and off because, you know, they all live in different places. So it wasn't possible. It's not like they're still teenagers where you can just hang out at the hellhole. Right. And, you yeah. know, ask them questions. <laughs> so. Uh, so I would go around to different places and do interviews when I could. And, uh, and then in 2018, I did get to follow them along on tour. I wouldn't say that I was on tour with them, but I kind of, you know, followed along here and there and, went, and, you know, got a bunch, you got to see him in action and get a bunch of great stories. And That's great. A lot, of, a lot of fun stuff came out of that. Yeah. I'll tell oh, you, you, you got to be a brave man. I don't even think I'd be able to talk to Dr. Graffin. He'd probably intimidate me so bad that I don't think I'd be able to say hi to him. You know what? He is a, a super nice guy, um, extremely generous person, and uh, and in all the ways the, of that word. And um, and also, he's written books before, so uh, he was like super cool to me because um, I think he knew the challenges that go into writing on a book and collaborating on a book. Right. And so, so Jim, uh, how did you get into journalism? How, how, so that was really cool. When you were young, how, how, how did that happen, bud? Zines, baby. Uh, punk rock zines. Did, did any of you guys read zines? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, 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 mean, I see I mean, your name as Flipside. Yeah. Flip, that, I, I read uh, that about you. What Flipside? Yeah, um, I, I can't really say that I did any remarkable uh, journalism. For Flip. <laughs> I did some good interviews with Flipside, but I was still learning and uh, um, you know figuring some things out. And so when Flipside went under, and uh, my editor there, Todd, started up Razor Cake with Sean Carswell, I was like, okay, uh, um, if I'm going to do this, I gotta I gotta be uh, get on my A game. I gotta step it up a little bit. And, um, and geez, it's been like 20 years now. How, how do you go from, uh, from, you know, basically being a zine kid to, you know, like writing a book on fucking bad religion and uh, also worthy of mention, uh, you know, Keith Morris. How, how, how did that, yeah, well, how, how did that the, whole thing uh, go down? Well, the, um, the Keith Morris book came first. So that was a huge help. And uh, yeah. I mean, that was, I would say, like the main thing, because when Bad Religion was looking for a book, looking for someone, you know, a writer to write their book, um, the <coughs> Keith Morris book had just come out, My Damn It. And so people were reading it, people were liking it. So people say, who do you think we should get for this book? My name just came up a lot. And it also helped that uh, Bad Religion's tour manager um, lives out in the desert or he was at the time, he's spending a lot of time in the desert. And uh, some colleagues of mine um, on the literary side of the game live out there. So, um, you know, people I call friends, they say, who should we, who's a punk rock guy we can write this book? And so everybody was just saying my name. And maybe that only would have been true for, you know, a small window of time in, in the universe, <laughs> but it worked out, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah, so man. The funny thing uh, about how, 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 <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say, how how do you get involved with uh, the Keith Keith Morris book then? Well, uh, the funny thing about books is that every book is different. Either how it gets made, um, the writing of it, the rollout, every bit of it is different. And um, and sometimes it's not. It, it's a lot of it is like being at the right place at the right time. 
And um, it just so happened that the editor of DeCapo Press, who um, is the editor that I've been working with for the last several years, um, he used to work with my agent. So from time to time, they just get on the phone and they just kind of spitball and say, hey, because uh, they are Gen X guys and they're always like, you know, they were in bands and they were into punk rock and they were kind of getting a sense that like you know, things are changing. You know, people are, you know, the book world is more interested in this stuff. And now when you go to, you know, some of these publishers or some of these TV studios and things like that, you're going to find some old punks who are there. That wasn't true, you know, 20 yeah, years Yeah, fuck ago, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, it, 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 what's, uh, what's the saying? Like, you can look at a kid with a mohawk and you don't know if you're looking at a philosopher or not, you know? Yeah, all right. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would just Absolutely. like to point out, I, I would just um, like to point out uh, your Bad Religion book uh, yeah. debuted at number 13 from uh, the American Press Association. So I mean that's that's something, man. Like that's a book about a fucking punk rock band, like de debuting way up there. So, you know, congratulations. Yeah, like, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was that was really cool. It was really cool. I, I think uh, that, um, and it doesn't get a lot of credit, but the the No Effects book, which yeah, uh, came nice. out I think a, little, the year before, a couple years before, um, which is an amazing book. Um, yes. That, yeah. That made the New York Times bestseller list, and I think that opened up a lot of eyes. And people were like, "Man, if we make these books, people will read them." You know, there there's a readership for it. I mean, and um, and I think what publishing is starting to understand is that um, you know, punk readers. You know, people you see a punk rock, you don't think of readers, but they're fans first and foremost, and they're loyal. They will stay by their bands or they'll, they'll buy their records 20 years later and they make a book they'll buy it oh, and, yeah uh, yeah we want to know about these guys right like yeah you we even buy the records the new records that you know you, you you might hear a few things and you're like i hate it but you'll still buy it because you're a completist <laughs> and you want you know there's at least one good song on there that you like and, you know it we are we're uh that's a good point jim we're we're, we're definitely definitely a, a loyal fan base uh a friend of mine always says the best people in the world he knows are in the punk rock scene. And uh, yeah. I, I got a tendency, I have a tendency to agree. Um, there's a, just like a deep loyalty to, to the bands, to the friends, to, uh, you know, just, just the, the bit of it, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I, 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 I read your book and I, I thought it was phenomenal. I'm a huge Bad Religion fan. Um, I drove these guys crazy now for months and months and months, posting the same videos over and over, the same, uh, you know, <laughs> You know, uh, clips about bad religion over and over, and uh, they're just they're they're a great band. I mean, just, I can't think of one I like better. Um, it just uh, you know, it, it had to be something being out there and talking to each one of them and getting to know them. Um, what was what was Brett Gerwitz? How did, what did Brett Gerwitz strike you as? You know, it's funny. I was nervous about meeting Brett. I mean, I, in a way, I was nervous about meeting all of them because it was a one-on-one -on -one situation. I met each member of the band uh, in a one-on-one -on -one situation. So uh, it was like going on dates in a way because it, I was very much aware <laughs> that it was an audition, right? That you don't want to be, I mean, you don't want to be the guy that um, who doesn't know anything about the band or comes across like an idiot. But right. also, you don't want to be the opposite of that. You don't want to be the punisher, and uh, you you want, you want to, to be the find guy that who middle ground. With them at the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's what I was hoping. I was hoping they'd all pick me, right? So. <laughs> exactly, though. That's exactly right. I, I mean, uh, it must have been a blessing and a curse, though. I mean, you got forty years of material to sift through. I mean, holy shit. How did you even manage that? Whew. Yeah, well, um, just to get back to that oh, original sorry. question about Brett, I met him last uh, of the four of the four guys who are who, who are the four main voices in the book, and uh, and I know he's the busiest, and it was um, and it wasn't a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I met him with the tour manager, so it was it was kind of quick, and it, it was yeah, I really didn't know what to think, you know, it's kind of like, right. yeah, yeah, I'll give you whatever you need. And I'm like, okay, well, that sounds good. You know? <laughs> and, um, but because he was always 
is like in the not always, but because he was mostly in LA in his office, he was always super cool about making time for me. And and I think he's really good about making time for a lot of journalists. Uh, I think he he just kind of gets it. And um, he just spent so much time with me. And I mean, I could have gone. I mean, I th I personally think that each one of these guys now. Greg already has, but they can all write their own books. There's, there's so much to their story and there's so much, they've been at it for so long that there's nothing to stop them from writing their own memoirs where they can get, you know, as personal or as technical or do whatever they want. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I, I, that's, that's another one that if I, uh, we, we've had this podcast, uh, internet TV show, whatever you want to call it for a little while now. And, you know, I get nervous every time. I still do, man. And uh, I thought about that, you know, people from Dr. Graffin coming on or like, you know, Brett Gerwitz. I don't know if I'd be able to, you know, I, I'd be like, holy, whoa, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, just get a little bit nervous there. And uh, uh, the fact that you got to meet all of them and just just hang out and, you know, get get what you needed to get and then write this just wonderful detailed book, man. I mean, it, uh, it that, that, that really, that's a, that's a great thing, Jim. I mean, it, you know, you, you wrote that Keith Morris book. That wasn't bad. That wasn't bad either. Not here. You're writing something. The SST Records book. Is that is that is that what? Did I hear right? Yeah, that's right. Now that's that's not a book I'm writing with the label. Um, that's just something I'm doing on my own. Um, okay. Of course, I, I talked to a lot of people and got a lot of help with it, but uh, yeah, it's not. It's an unofficial uh, biography of SST Records because, as you can imagine. Uh, there wasn't a lot of co cooperation from the label. No, 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 no. Greg Gaines not exactly what you call cooperative. So. Hey, especially when you're calling uh, the book uh, Corporate Rock Sucks, or is that just a working <laughs> title? Um, I think that's going to be the title. It's uh, nice. you know, That's one of these things that these titles are often, um, you know, by committee. And, um, you know, sometimes a band will have a really good idea or sometimes I'll have a, an idea. But the rule of thumb is whatever you start with is usually not what you finish with. And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. And I think that, um, I don't know, it's, uh, I, I was okay with them. That was not my original title, but I was okay with that one because it kind of gets right to the, uh, to the heart of things. And it's, as you know, it's not the slogan. The slogan is corporate rock still sucks. So I figured... <laughs> All these cranky Gen, Gen Xers can just start their arguing before they even open the book, right? You know, uh, being, being a cranky Gen Xer, I know I would be the same way. Like, oh come on, now that's not even the slogan. You know, let me read this. You know, you know, you know it's funny. I got I got younger kids, and it sounds an awful lot like a bunch of kids trying to come up with some rules for a game. You know, they never actually wind up playing. They just <laughs> they just get the rules down, just oh, arguing yeah. nonstop. But, Isn't that amazing? You're just like you kind of go into it, and uh, you're like watching your kids. Like, man, you are bossy. What, what's up with all these rules? We don't <laughs> give you those kind of rules, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah but I'm I'm not, let me yeah. springboard off something you said there, Jim. Was um, that how how what you what you start writing isn't always end up what, what you end up with. So how was that true for Do What You Want? Um. For the title or just about the book in general? The book in general. The book in general, it was, um, I mean, Keith was, I mean, that's his voice, you know, with the bad religion, because it's, it's you know, you're dealing with a, a band and all the different people in it, that's like more of a different narrative voice. But with Keith, that's Keith's voice. Those are his stories. And we talked for a long, 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 long time. And, um, and you know, Keith is a storyteller and he has a very distinctive way of talking. So like, it was really important that that be accurate. You know, it, it's got to sound like Keith. Otherwise, what's the point of even, of even doing a book? Right. And um, I will say this, that Keith was super involved, super invested, and he read through the manuscript several times. He caught typos that like the, the professional type uh, copy editors didn't catch. I mean, he was, I mean, he read the book like two or three times, you know, he was not like, 
um, yeah, yeah, that's good. Just send it off and let me cash my check. And sadly, there are musicians out there um, who will do that. I don't think you find that in punk rock. I don't think you find that in really any kind of extreme music. But there, there are clients out there who will be like, I write what you want just as long as the, the check gets to my bank account. Right. I could imagine having a biography written about me and not caring what was in it. That would be uh, <laughs> that would be insanity. <laughs> All right. I mean, you hit on something really good because it is nerve wracking when you not when I turn it into publisher, but when I give it to the give it to them because the client because it's it's got to be weird having someone you know. Oh yeah. I mean, imagine that take you're your words reading. and tell your story. You, you know, know I, mean, I, 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 I spent. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to touch off you. You were saying you spent. Uh... I spent so many hours with Keith, and uh, and we're and I'm, we're friends now because you know we just spent so much time together and um, shooting the shit. And plus, I mean, I was a total fan. It's not. It, yeah, it was a, a work for hire situation but you know i was like a kid in a candy store i mean i was getting to hear <laughs> are you kidding all these stories you know directly uh, from keith and and it's amazing guys i'll talk to keith you know still today and he'll, he'll come out with shit that i've never heard before like like oh. keith why did not you tell me that we were doing doing the book <laughs> that'd be an awesome <laughs> story <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, 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 let me throw this at you. Did you know that before Keith was in a band that he was a roadie for uh, the Commodores for a couple of weeks? Really? Oh, no. <laughs> right? No. Right? Right? The Commodores, huh? That's so badass. Wow. Wait, I mean, that's, isn't that's there why, uh, it, 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 isn't there a movie about uh, Keith uh, that's that you're you're helping create, right? About uh, uh, about his early years um, up until Black Flag, right? Yeah, it's it's in the works. Um, it is it's it's. I thought publishing sl was slow, but the movie business is even slower, <laughs> especially uh, yeah. on, in the indie scene. And, and to be fair, um, COVID made it really really difficult for even the big studios to get anything done forget the indie houses so um but we mm -hmm. I, yeah we've got that going and uh, um you know we're gonna it's 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 in progress and uh the director of the documentary american hardcore paul yeah. Ruffin, you guys know that doc yeah. oh yeah um, i've watched oh, it yeah. a million times that's a great one he uh he's a fascinating guy um he had a really cool vision for the book which was just tell Keith's story, like basically this story ends where Black Flag begins. And there's practical reasons for that because you're never gonna get the rights to any Black Flag music or any of that kind of <laughs> stuff. But it's really Keith's coming of age story and a love letter to Homerosa Beach, which was such a, um, just such an interesting place and gave rise to so much fascinating music. I mean, all if you think about all the musicians that you know went to um, Miracosta High School in Manhattan Beach, which yeah. kind of sit right where Manhattan and Redondo and Hermosa all come together. I mean, we could spend the next 10 minutes listing, you know, people in punk and hardcore who went to that school, you know. It's we really had Felony incredible. Ron from Felony Records not too long ago. He, he's from that area, the Hermosa Beach area. And he was saying just about the same thing. Like, he lived next door to Jim Lindbergh from Pennywise. You know, he grew up, oh, yeah. you know, here in Black Flag. And I mean, it was, a, it was like punk rock heaven. Like, you know, and growing up in like some kind of crazy, you know, punk rock neighborhood, you know. And he, he just, he, you know, he was real fortunate. He just said how fortunate he was to grow up around that and you know, have such a solid scene and solid people around him. And he, he, uh, he, he really said a lot of same stuff right there, man. It, I, I can't believe just such a small area gave birth to such tal a, a talented pool of individuals. I mean, that's just, you know, what, 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 how likely is that for such an area to, it, it's just, it blows your mind when you get to thinking about it. Yeah. And, um, I don't have, I didn't grow up in that area, but I did live in the South Bay for all, about 10 years. And, uh, I started in uh, Manhattan beach. And, okay. uh, and just like learning the history of things. And uh, 
it sounds really silly and super official, but like that epic Black Flag show at Pollywog Park in Manhattan Beach on July 22nd in 1979. Um, that July 22nd is my birthday. So I always perked up and was like, oh, that was my birthday. What, what was all this? And then I was like, wow. like, pretty much every punk rocker in this, in the South Bay and the, and the L and plus guys from even the Valley were there. Like Jay Bentley at Bad Religion was there. Yep. Um, there's all kinds of rumors about who was there and everything. Uh, guys from Wasted Youth were there. Um, all the descendants, of course, Jeffrey Lee Pierce, um was writing about a spot who took all those great photos yeah and uh and when i talked i said like this was something that was this idea like this punk rock show outside it, was, it wasn't on the beach but it was near the beach it was completely unique in in, in california there was nothing else like that going on and, uh, and if you think about it, I mean, it's very true because, you know, punk rock didn't start in California. It didn't start in Hermosa Beach, but something really cool happened there. And you can, Absolutely. it all kind of boils down to that, you know, that one show. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So much, so much comes out of that, that scene. So much comes out of, you know, the LA scene. It, it all kind of said, the way I've seen it was, at least I understand it, is it was like, you know, the Ramones kind of came to LA and then the L.A. scene with the weirdos and Alice in the Bags and all that. And that started up and, you know, it kind of bled out to the valley where, you know, Greg and Brett were. And, uh, you know, they went to a Ramon show. And now we got ooh, ooh, so many records, <laughs> so many great songs. I mean, yeah. I, I, I couldn't tell you. Well, Jim, Jim, what's your favorite Bad Religion record? Oh, it's Suffer. Suffer? I love Suffer. Nice. <laughs> now, Suffer is a great record, but I got to go with No Control. I love No Control. But I mean, you got in fairness, both those albums basically within a year's time. You yeah. know, they're very, very by design, they were very similar. So, you know, it, it they're very, very similar records. I thought I just think for my money, I think No Control has the better songs. Well, uh for for me, um, you know, I would have to say, like going into the project, my and this is gonna sound dumb. Oh man, but my favorite bad religion record was the EP Back to the Known, right? Which is the one that they almost kind of disavow because, yeah. I mean, Frogger's on, Frogger's on there and they never play that song, ever. No, no. Right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, Hudson wrote that song, apparently, and it's, uh, and, and, and I guess people will feel that it's like, it's like a Circle Jerk song, and it kind of is. <laughs> and then, sure. um, um, and then, but like uh, New Leaf is a song that I love that I rarely, I, I've never heard them play that song live. I've never, um, I don't think I've heard really too much anything off there that they really have carried lately anyway, you know? Well, the theme, the theme song, Bad Religion, they call yeah. it the theme song, that that they play. But mm -hmm. um, but I think it was like Brett, Brett recorded it and he, and he hates the way it sounds. So it's not a big popular record with him, <laughs> but... It, it, uh, it's not bad though. I mean, you I know, have, it, I had it's uh, uh, ready to leave to go go back to. Oh, you're welcome to go back to uh, Virginia to go to school, and I had this tape. I think I got it somewhere here, and I had Bad Religion back to the known, and I didn't realize like, you know, I went through the whole culture shock of going from Virginia to California and the Navy and all that stuff. But I didn't wasn't ready for the culture shock of going back, and it's like, you know, where we're the kind of place where in Southwest Virginia where people still look at you funny with a pair of Doc Martens, and we're talking about 1988. Yeah. We're not talking yeah. about you know, you know, 1978. Right, you know? right. I mean, <laughs> it's all this all this stuff is is old hat, you know, all over the country, but you know, in in the in the country, you know, not in the cities, but in the country, it was still kind of new, still kind of shocking, still kind of provocative. And that tape really got me through, uh, you know, that experience. I was like, okay, I'm going back. That's to awesome, man. <laughs> <laughs> back to the known. <laughs> back to the known, yeah. So My um, first yeah. Bad that I'm sorry, go ahead. That, that I was uh, following around on in 2018, 
that was a year that they were playing the entire um, supper set. They didn't oh, do it, it every show, but they picked a few. They picked several shows where they would just play the whole album, like side one, take a break, talk for a sec, side two, and you know it's my opinion that like when a band plays a record front to you know the entire record that is really a gift to the fans yeah. because that's not how the songs were recorded. That's not how they were written or conceived. It's just how they were sequenced and it's how the fan experiences it. And then with most bands, by religion not included, I mean, there were guys in the band that had to learn all those songs because half of them were songs on a lit uh, were, you know, maybe they never played before. So yeah. A lot of effort has to go into doing that kind of stuff and even those who people who wrote it have to go back and be like what the hell was i thinking why did i write it this way i would yeah. do it differently now but okay yeah. i guess relearn and, uh, it. it's been a decade since they so played just it. like hearing hearing that record over and over and over again i just you know it just got to the point where at certain points i just get chills mm. and i was like man this, these these guys like they were on to something and nobody knew it, you know? I mean, Fat Mike knew it, uh, Pennywise knew it. The first time they heard it, they were like, you know, their heads exploded. But I mean, you think about 1988 and what was going on and it's like... Hair. No reason, do we? 88, I was nine years old. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, I, I got I got really lucky in 2014. I got to see uh, Bad Religion play the entirety of Suffer uh, in front of like 50,000 people. And it was it was a hell of an experience. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was phenomenal. And and just recently, uh, th thanks to you, Jim, I got to uh, listen to Suffer with some full context and it just sent chills down my spine again. You know, um, I, I finished off your book yeah, I mean, and, uh, and and I started I started listening to the whole discography like front to back. And, and I got to say, like, out of that suffers, suffers my favorite. It was Generator before, but um, just understanding the significance of that record. And, and thank you for getting that significance through in your book. You know, like that, well, that was you. something real special. Well, I mean, now, like what our planet is going through, it's like it's. I mean, it, it's a miracle that that uh, Greg and Brett aren't just completely depressed, you know, because they were writing about this <laughs> 40 years ago. And, you know, I think we're and we still haven't learned the lesson, you know, that we're that we're all in this together, that we're all responsible for what happened to for the health of the planet. And unless we all together do something about it, we're going to destroy it. And it's going to be mm -hmm. um, hell on earth, literally, when we do. I mean, they, they well, I, I'm that, on. No, it, it seems to be anybody with any it up, insight, man. anybody who can look at society, especially through the lens like, you know, a Greg Grassman has or, or a girl that write songs, uh, you know, that pertain to the world in a way no one really wants to see it. It's like people will finally, you know, 40 years later, like, oh, God, they, they were saying that, just like you were saying, they were saying that 40 years ago. It's like the clairvoyance of Nostradamus. No one actually knows what he meant until they actually pick up and go, oh, shit, <laughs> he was right, you know? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's so few bands that um, have timeless relevance, you know, and, and, and Bad Religion is certainly one of them. They, uh, they, the room, yeah, can, so, can really... um... I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. I was just saying, you really summed up the message, I think, of their, their songs. I mean, you know, they, front to back, and I'm, I'm not just talking about soccer. I'm just, I'm talking about, I think if there was, if Greg was to say, you know, Dr. Graffin was to say there was an overall message, I think he just nailed it on the head. That, you know, we, we, we're just trying to tell you, you know, what, what has, what we've done in the past, and the past repeats itself. And now we're, we're going into the, the way the world is today, we're on fire. I mean, it's, 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 it's already done. And, you know, we're repeating the same mistakes. And that's exactly, I, I agree with you 100%. That's exactly what they were saying. You need to stick together. You need to figure things out and make it better for each other because everybody's, it, everything affects everything. And people just never seem to learn that. They never seem to learn that. And at the end of the day, you know, what's it worth if you, if you can't enjoy something with somebody else? You know, and I, I, that was the message I took. 
I think through most of the whole discography, man. I mean, like, I think that's why I, I love it so much. Well, I really appreciate that because, uh, you know, I tried to take the easy way and be like, so, Greg, what's your legacy? What is this all about? And he was all like, ha, ha, ha. You know, that's your job, Jim. You know, I'm, you know, you have to figure that out for yourself. And, uh, you know, it was like one of those uh, um, old samurai movies where I was like, you know, I was like, okay, I'll figure it out. And be like, and then I like came down from the mountain and was like, shit. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Are you telling me that Greg Graffin told you you'll get no direction from me? <laughs> Very well oh played. man <laughs> oh he, he just he has got a way that man that man has a way right and i was listening today and a song hit me today that was just it, it, it's hit me in the past but it hit me today for some reason that news from the front it was a, a b-side originally I you know for stranger and fiction and then i think now when you buy stranger and fiction it comes on it and I, I i may i may be wrong but uh, that that song, for some reason, it, it it totally summed up like what went on in the summer of 2020. I mean, I, I listened to it. And I'm like, oh wow, George Floyd. You know, what I mean, like, yeah, I, I mean, it, that's what I hear. You know, um, it's just so much longer for the victim. I mean, it just yeah, it just the things that he the man says are they're almost prophetic in a way. You know, and for you to get there to sit and talk to him and then then have him distill it down to know, you know, you got to figure it out. That that is a uh, that blows my mind, dude. I mean, that had to really be something to hear. I mean, that, I'm a, I mean, obviously, I'm a huge fan. So, I mean, it, it just, that blows my mind. Yeah, I, that, that is really, really, really great, man. Yeah, I mean, I really uh, don't expect to have uh, an experience quite like that one ever again, even if I write another 10 books. And uh, just great. because for everything that you're saying about just like how, uh, it, you know, it, intelligent and, and and thoughtful those lyrics are on the other side i mean they're also really amazing musicians and great songwriters i mean there was a time when i was in the studio when they were recording uh age of reason and um and brett had called i was you know brett would be like hey jim sit here we're gonna do this and explain things and then things would happen and and he called in brian he, to do a couple of um you know, he was going to overdub a couple of like, not quite solos, but just some things to kind of put in against something. And so, right. you know, they, they started, you know, Brian came in and just like stood like about eight inches away from my face and started playing. <laughs> and I was like, good Lord, you know, and like there was, he played like three different things. And it's, and what's interesting None of it got used, even though it was all <laughs> amazing. It was like, yeah. but that wasn't the point of whether or not it was good. It was, the point was whether or not it fit with what he was trying to do, and Brett yeah. decided it didn't. Yeah. I mean, Brett's going to do, I mean, Brian's going to do something amazing every time he picks up the guitar. And yeah. I guess I just kind of taken that for granted. Like, oh yeah, Brian's a really good guitar player. But like when it was <laughs> just right there, it was, it was like an emotional experience. Like I like I wanted to like reach out and touch the guitar. I like had to like say, Jim, don't touch the guitar. They're recording now. This is you're acting like a crazy person. Uh Jim, like that that's why we go to fucking shows, man. That's why we go to shows. Yeah. It is to it's to witness, right? And uh how lucky. How lucky yeah. and fortunate. Luck has nothing to do with it. Fortunate. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, but that's kind of like, you know, punk rock in a nutshell, right? To go there to you know, be there, you know, with your friends and for your friends to experience something together. And um, yeah, I mean, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to like, do you mind, do you guys mind if I just shift gears a little bit here uh, with Jim? Um, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a writer, like I love writing. And I had some questions just about your writing uh, career and, and your path, if that's cool. Sure. Um, just, uh, I just wanted to throw out some books here, like uh, Big Lonesome, uh, Given the Finger and Forest of Fortune, um, three books that we haven't mentioned here yet. And they're all different and they're all cool. I, I haven't uh, read it, any of them admittedly but uh, I, I definitely read some synopses and some excerpts from them and uh by the i will be picking them up by the way 
Um, but, uh, you know, you've got a project vermin on the mount. Uh, congratulations, 15 years, I believe. And, um, yeah, you know, you're still zine in it uh, with uh, with razor cake. And uh, <laughs> just I, I stumbled upon a really, a really funny thing here. Uh, razor cake number 84. Uh, Jim Ruland is on acid talking to uh, the bloated baby head of Hunter S. Thompson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that really rang a bell for me. I, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And, and these guys will tell you. Um, uh, but I, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, sure, you know, you. Too. <laughs> you've you've got a you got a huge body of work and i'm curious what what's your favorite format to write in man like you know you got so many to choose from here you know my my i think a lot of writers will tell you this my favorite format is whatever i'm not working on right now i mean it's that whole whole grass is always greener syndrome and yeah. because i write fiction and i do these nonfiction projects when it when i'm writing fiction i'm like Man, this is hard. I've written myself into a corner. I wish, I wish I was like working on a book with Keith again. And you just like tell what happened. How hard is that, right? Just yeah. tell me what to, to write with one of these books, and you know, transcribing interviews and trying to figure out like, well, wait, which did this show happen before this release? Was this member a part of the band later? Like trying to get everything straight. And I'm like. Man, I wish I was writing yeah. a story where I could just make shit up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, totally. It's that kind of thing, you know. Um, you know, I'm really fortunate that uh, I've kind of fallen into this uh, um, this gig of writing about you know you know punk rock and you know working with bands and things of that nature, and uh, I hope that that continues, but. I've always been someone that, you know, I, I just kind of write what I want to write. And uh, you know, that's why I was like really drawn to zines in the sense mm -hmm. that there's no like, all right, Jim, here's what you're gonna, you're gonna give me 400 words about Dave Matthews today. And it's like, well, no, I'm not, you know, so I've never been like kind of a writer. You know, it's it's funny that you mentioned that I uh, I, I did some uh, uh, I, I flirted with a, a magazine out of Toronto for um, you know somewhere in the '90s. I was this little punk rock kid with a camera and, and some heart, and yeah, I, you know, I wanted to write about like you know Bad Religion and uh, um, you know Vans Warp Tour, you know, you name it, and uh, and they had me writing articles about uh, you know Biff Naked, who's who's kind of cool. Um, but not really my thing, you know, and, uh, and Dave Matthews, funny that you mention it, uh, you know, tea party, that kind of bullshit. Um, so it never really worked out for me. You know, I didn't hang in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, there's, the, you know, there's, the, I mean, the, even in the stuff that you're really passionate about, there's still going to be a grind. There's no getting away from the grind. And, you know, I say I always was drawn to doing what I want, but I think also, I never would have gotten to this point if I didn't also have a lot of experience of working with editors and writing for an audience like I did with uh, Razor Cake and, and then also writing for like newspapers and magazines, learning how to write profiles, learning how to write, you know, book reviews and things like that and taking a lot of guidance and editorial insight and, you know, people just saying this, I don't know what you mean. You're going to have to do this again. And you're being like, okay. So like just doing what I want doesn't mean like my first draft rules. Fuck you guys. I mean, that's not what I'm saying at all. <laughs> um, and I, and you know, I mean, I think like a lot of people never get past that and, and that's fine. Right. You know, I yeah. mean. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah, that's a question of you, Jim. If it's uh, professionally, personally, and uh, it would say geographically, uh, being that you've been able to interview, talk with, and and you know basically critique punk rocks, some of punk rocks and legends. What do you find to be a common denominator amongst the personalities of those who have lasted the years still play the music? The common denominator. That's really fascinating uh, uh, because I'm just thinking about all the different. Um, um, you know, interviews that I did for this SST book. I mean, I think what it is is, uh, is, is it's not so much a, like having a belief in yourself, but it's a certain amount uh, of fearlessness. 
And I think it's not fearlessness of being like people who come out of the shoot who are just are not afraid of anything, like the biggest guy in the pit. Not that kind of mentality, but the kind of mentality that comes with like, you know, well, shit, this didn't work and that didn't work and this didn't work. So I'm just going to do it my way. And, 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 you know, if it doesn't work, great. But if it does, even better. That kind of fearlessness just to go for it. And um, it's also kind of a uh, kind of a California thing too. I want to say, and that I, like if you look at the main difference between like California punks and other scenes that came before it, is that um, you know a lot of like the people in the punk rock got snapped up by major labels, and that didn't really happen in California. So people had to be like, you know, I'm going to do this myself, or we're going to let our friend put out our record and we're going to do, we're, you know, that kind of like real DIY self-reliance. Um, and it wasn't something that they strove to do, but it was just kind of like this discovery that you could do it and be like, wouldn't it be cool to do it? And not even thinking about what it means to fail. I mean, I, th I think the story of bad religion, you can follow that journey there too. And, and then they did uh, into the unknown. Everyone had to, Reevaluate. Uh, uh, we, we don't journey. talk about that. <laughs> Progressive rock 101. <laughs> hey, th there are people out there who will tell you it's their favorite record. I don't get Joe it. Go up, church. My best friend. One of my best friends. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not it's a bad album. It's just not, it's just not a bad rock. religion album. <laughs> yeah. In what I conceive a bad religion album. Yeah, well, my, my sense is that when they took that record on the road, um, oh shit, I'm totally not prepared to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> they, when they played it in clubs, they didn't have the uh, the synthesizer, right? They just did it with strings, and it sounded kind of cool, right? Maybe a little different, a little slower, but it was it sounded like Bad Religion. But then when you add in like that that instrument, it's just like, what the heck is this? It's just totally different. But um, the song um, on their last in the last tour in 2020 before they had to shut things down, or maybe it's 2019. Sorry, they they rolled out one of the songs from uh, Into the Unknown, and it sounded rad. So it took some time. Uh, I wish I could remember the name. Of that. That record, I, I I didn't hear that till later on. The first, I'll be honest, the first record I ever heard by Bad Religion, I'm uh, I'll be I'll be forty. Are you done? Hmm. All right, Jeb, you said you were in the Navy, correct? Yes, that's right. So I have a oh. question. Sorry, Are you Shell back or not? Oh, I was muted. My yeah, yeah. Sorry, dude, you got uh, you got cut off there. I was saying uh, the the first record I ever 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 owned by Bad Religion. I'll, I'll, I'll be thirty nine. Uh, the first record I ever owned was Recipe for Hate. First okay. song I ever heard was on the All Ages album my buddy had, and I, that was a great introductory. And then I got this Recipe for Hate thing, right? I'm kind of like I got this over here, and this is rad, you know. Like you know, uh, All Ages was a, a compilation that had everything from supper down, you know, down to where I'm sitting at. And I'm, I'm listening to things like, I mean, Recipe for Hate is a great record. Please don't, I'm not saying it's not a good record, but compared to the other stuff, I was at first a little disappointed. I was like, I don't know, man. Anesthesia is a hell of a lot better than American Jesus. I don't know, man, you know? But then it something hit me when we got to Stranger Than Fiction. And I went back and that, that other record sounded completely different. You know, it sounded fresh, it sounded great. And then I heard Skyscraper. You know, when you're a teenager, to be fair, you know, you kind of stick to a few songs, four or five songs on a record, and you skip around. And uh, sometimes you don't pay attention to the, the good stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, Modern Day Catastrophe, Skyscraper, you know, all that stuff was on there. And I got to that song and I said, holy shit, this is the greatest band I ever heard in my life. You know, and uh, I went back and listened to All Ages again. <laughs> I, I know that makes like totally no sense, but. They, they just, they've been such a staple band that I, I just, I go through these throws with their records, you know, at one point I'm listening to True North, one point I'm listening to No Control, you know, and it just, it never, ever, ever 
you know, it, it never ends really. It's just like they, they, I never get tired of it, ever. Like back, I mean, after Into the Unknown, you know, they they figured out their format and they stuck to it. And they weren't going to get burned again. So, like, when Bad Religion comes on, you can kind of tell almost right away that's a Bad Religion song. It's like the Ramones, right? You know what you're listening down to. On. Yeah. Yeah. But I think a lot of people who are just casual fans don't get past that. And they don't realize that there's a really, like, broad spectrum of different styles and types of music that they put out. Oh, yeah. In, career and i jay told me um when i talked to him about like the set list and going into all that is that there are songs that you know bad religion that are beloved by bad religion fans that their peers would never ever try would never even consider putting on a record and and i think we all probably have a have a song that's an outlier in their catalog but it's just really moving for whatever reason uh, long. for us for me yeah for me alone. it's that song uh, beyond electric dreams um it's such a it doesn't sound like a like anything else bad religion ever did but man what a what a great song and, and, and I, I mean you you got so me on it jim i love that, that, that I, I, when you said that i said oh, okay <laughs> uh, there's also you know it, it's kind of more a formulatic song but you never hear anybody talk about it is uh you know only rain from the you know it's a, it's a newer song it's not uh, not not quite old yeah. but the the lyrics there are unbelievable i mean probably the best i think i think probably the best lyrics he's written ever are in that song and then the devil goes dance that that one right after uh only rain on that album it is uh it's phenomenal you know and that is that that's kind of an outlier cuz that's it sounds almost like pop rock almost but when, when greg sings over it you don't care you know yeah. it's just it's a beautiful song so uh i know i want to go, the... uh, go back to a question that uh that the reverend johnny jenkins asked about uh <laughs> he asked me if i was uh a shellback shell <laughs> and i want to say yes i am a trusty shellback and now i'd like to know uh why you asked that question uh you know did you have to dress up for the occasion or you still, still the weirdness that goes on my dad told me stories. He was a Marine, so he told me all kinds of stories <laughs> of traveling with yeah, you guys. So, <laughs> so um, I was in the Navy in, in the 80s, and um, what we're talking about is that the the Navy had all these um, rituals. Amazing. And um, when you cross the equator, um, there's this uh, weird thing that happens where everybody on the ship who is... Uh, who has crossed the equator previously is a trusty shellback. And everyone who has never crossed the equator before is a slimy polywog. And it doesn't matter if it's your first week on the ship or you've been in the Navy 20 years. It doesn't matter if you're scrubbing the pots in the galley or if you're a, uh, you know, an ensign, an officer. All those, all those barriers break down and it comes down to two things, shellback or polywog. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you're, if you're a polywog, you're going to get hazed in a very <laughs> theatrical way that um, they probably can't do anymore. <laughs> probably should, we probably shouldn't even be talking about this. Do you, do you, got, a, do you, do you got a commemorative tattoo for it? Uh, no, no, I have a lot of uh nautical tattoos, but um, I didn't get any of them in the navy. There was a shipmate of mine who got the uh, um, you know, that the panther clawing up the arm tattoo, like that one, the black, yeah, he got that in um, in the long po, and he got jaundice. <laughs> uh, I was like, okay, I'm like, wow. no, no tattoos for this sailor, um, till. <laughs> oh shit yeah we're done well jim um you know i i don't want to keep you any longer uh we've kept you long enough uh you've been more than gracious with your time yes you have you've uh you've been a hell of a guest thank you so much for uh sharing your stories and your time um 
yeah, uh, guys. Yeah. I, I appreciate you a lot, man. Thank you very, very, very much. You're, you're very welcome. You your shirt. And just a I'm shout I'm out really... from you, Jim, for whoever doesn't, isn't uh, aware of, her, of what the limit of the month is, if you want to throw out any kind of link information. Yeah, right now, Vermin on the Mount's on hiatus because of COVID and everything. That's like a kind of like a live in-person thing. And uh, that's really, you know, not happening right now. Um, the the, the uh, Do What You Want, the Bad Religion book is coming out in paperback on yes. the middle of August. So it should yes. be out now and when, yes. you're, when you're looking at this. It'll be out in paperback. Go and, get it. Go uh, get it. Pick it up, man. And, I got my my, uh, my SST book will be out in April of uh, 2022. So you won't have uh, nice. very long to wait for that one. It's being awesome. uh, copy edited right now. Awesome. Awesome. I'm real happy. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. We got to talk to Bill Stevenson of the Descendants, and he was just like, dude, one of the greatest dudes you're ever going to meet. <laughs> like, straight up. He was just so cool, man. So I'm excited for that book, man. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You're very welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys for having me on. And uh, oh, I mean, it's no surprise anytime, you're our religion fans. So that means you're the best. <laughs> you got Thanks, Jim. Man. It's been anytime. a pleasure, man. Thanks so much, Jim. Appreciate it, man. You're welcome. Cheers. Take care. You're good, Jim.